Good morning. We're here. The final unit of the year. Um, the U.S. Civil War. We've kind of been leading up to this really all year going back to our second unit where we talked about the differences between like the New England colonies and the middle colonies and finally the southern colonies. Uh, the differences we were talking about the crops and the, the type of people who move there and things like that. So um, it's a big deal, obviously, in American history, the U.S. Civil War. Um, some of the things that you've probably heard, uh, things like, you know, Gettysburg or Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee or the Confederacy, um, maybe these are things that you've been able to place in history, but maybe these are things that you haven't been able to place in history, um, but it all ties into the U.S. Civil War. Um, so the plan for this unit is, again, I'm going to make it a little bit different than I would if I was actually standing in front of you in class, is... Um, we're going to um, try to look at individuals uh, and the impact that they had on the Civil War and sort of teach it that way. Um, so we'll be talking about other things as well. Um, but every single lesson there should be, um, you should be like, oh, that's the person that Mr. Moscow was talking about. Uh, in this case, we're actually going to double it up with uh, somebody named Dred Scott and somebody named Roger Tanney. So by the end of this lesson. Um, the assignment for this lesson, lesson one, uh, is all about the causes of the war. Um, and what you're going to have to do is fill in the notes of the lecture that I'm going to give right now um, if they're not already filled in. So for some of them, they're done for you. For others of them, you're going to have to fill those in. Maybe there's like four or five of them. Um, so you don't need complete sentences necessarily, just bullet points of some of the main ideas that I discuss for each one. Um, all right, well, let's talk about why we had a civil war um, that killed upwards of almost 700,000 people. It's actually tough to um, have a precise number. They're not exactly sure, but the estimates range from about 620,000 to almost 800,000 soldiers died. Uh, it is the bloodiest war in America. The scope of it, it's huge, right? When we talk about the American Revolution um, and, you know, the number of uh, American patriots' lives lost, you know, the numbers maybe. 12,000, 20,000, somewhere in that range. Um, you had that many Americans dying in a day sometimes during the uh, U.S. Civil War. So you take an eight-year war like the American Revolution, and you had that many people dying in one or two days, some of these, these battles. Gettysburg, for instance, over 50,000 Americans died. Well, 50,000 people who either were Americans or had decided to leave America and be, join the Confederacy. Um over 50,000 in just three days. So truly staggering numbers. Anyway, I'm rambling on because I get so uh, interested in this stuff. The first one, Missouri Compromise. So the Civil War, the first shots aren't fired until 1861. Think about that number. That, that's the one you're going to have to remember, 1861. So we're talking about 41 years before. Now listen, you could, you could go to different documentaries or different YouTube videos on the Civil War or read different things. And they would probably, if you had a hundred historians, they would give you a hundred different causes of the Civil War, which one came first, which was most important, things like that. Um, through my own research, and again, I'm not some Civil War expert, right? There are, there are people who know more than I do, but I've been teaching this for a while. I think the Missouri Compromise was important back in 1820. So I choose to sort of start there, even though it's 41 years before, because the Missouri Compromise was this line right here, that little red line that divided the country in two, essentially based upon an important law, law and slavery. So as the notes say right here, it allowed the country to expand westward without constantly debating slavery. So every time a state got added, they didn't have to, or in theory, theory, uh, sort of provide the, well, is this going to be a new slave state or a new free state, a new slave state or a new free state? For instance, when Missouri was added as a slave state, Maine separated from Massachusetts and became a free state. So they wanted to keep the number of senators the same. Um, you'll notice that some of the already established slave states like Virginia or Kentucky um, already fall above that red line, but they're saying anything going forward. So as you go into, and of course this land that was Mexico and Spain later becomes uh, the Southwest, that could be open to slavery. Um, so while it is a compromise, we talked about how compromise in this class, not always great because if you give up something that is of 
sincere value to you or your, you know, your, your life or your integrity are at stake, then that's not a good thing. Um, well, in this case, it's just the idea of having a country, uh, two separate countries. You know, if you, I mean, what is a country? Is it a, a shared set of laws, a shared set of beliefs held by people? Well, if you have, if you don't have those things, right? In fact, if you actually legislate the opposite, that they're, they, these things are, these are not shared laws, well, then you're probably going to start to feel a little less like a country. Um, so one set of laws for south of the line and one set of laws for north of the line. So that's why I would put the Missouri Compromise as a cause of the U.S. Civil War. The next one, again, we're a ways before the actual first shots are fired, right? First shots are not fired until 1861. So we're over 30 years before that is called the Doctrine of Nullification. Now, I use 1828 because that's usually when they started, but the Doctrine of Nullification was actually a, a continuing thing for four or five years. The Doctrine of Nullification was South Carolina attempting to um, nullify, that means to get rid of, like strike through, certain federal laws, especially ones involving tariffs, okay? So tariffs are taxes that are paid by people who bring goods in to a country. Um, financially, these tariffs would do harm to South Carolina, so they didn't want to abide by them. That's not really how the federal government works, right? We have something called the Supremacy Clause. The federal government's laws matter more than the state laws do, okay? That's just how our country works. So you know, Concord, New Hampshire, yes, important things go on, important bills are passed. However, if Washington, D.C. passes something that is in conflict with something that is passed in Concord, then Washington, D.C. wins out. So in this case, the people of South Carolina were attempting to use um, the federal law as sort of like a menu, you know, like if you go into a restaurant, you don't have to... Um, order all the items, right? You just sort of pick that one and that one and that one. Well, that's not, you can't pick which laws um, you're going to follow. You have to follow them all. Uh, so this is called the doctrine of nullification. Uh, and immediately it sort of puts the focus that South Carolina is going to be a leader in this um, conflict. Uh, and it is for a long, long time. And we'll see that later. Uh, this gentleman here is picture, uh, or I guess, is that a painting? I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell. It's, it's kind of like a, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, his name is John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was from South Carolina, and he also ascended to the vice presidency. He was the first vice president for Andrew uh, Jackson, right? The guy who we've been talking about with the Indian Removal Act and the Battle of New Orleans, right? That Andrew Jackson. They're both Southerners, Andrew Jackson from Tennessee, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. But you'll notice how he said he was the first vice president. Uh, Andrew Jackson, for a second term, actually switched who his vice president was. Now, that's not a very common thing that happens in American history. But one of the reasons is because John C. Calhoun favored this doctrine of nullification, saying that South Carolina, his home state, so it's almost like he had a little bit more allegiance to his home state of South Carolina than he did to the vice presidency, which he was the vice president of the entire country. He wasn't just the vice president of South Carolina. Um, so because of that conflict, that's one of the main reasons why uh, Andrew Jackson dumped him from the ticket um, and he had a new vice president for his uh, second term. So doctor of nullification, South Carolina uh, wanting to pick and choose which um, federal laws to follow um, led by the vice president. All right, on to the next one, the Compromise of 1850. So we jump ahead, but we're still more than a decade before the um, the Civil War, the first shots being fired. Compromise of 1850, again, more compromises are made to avoid genuine conflict. Um, and it just sort of if, kicking the can down the road, and that's what happened here. Uh, the Compromise of 1850, what were some of the big things? Well, one, there are some positives for from a abolitionist perspective, is that California, remember the California Gold Rush, 1849? Well, it's now it's 1850. California was admitted to the country as a free state. So no slavery in the new state of California. Now keep in mind, California didn't have 40 million people back then, but still, that was a that was a, a large piece of land and it's a step in the right direction. Also, no more slave slavery, slave trade anyway, in Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C., all the way to 1850, had 
there were slave markets there. I mean, the Capitol building was built in the White House. They were built with slave labor. So that was eliminated. So you're asking yourself, at least it should be, well, what's the other part of it? The other part of it is something called the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act is the reason why the Underground Railroad had to go all the way into Canada. Because even though northern cities um, like um, you know, Cincinnati or Philadelphia or New York or Boston, um, even though that no slavery was allowed there, um, because of the Fugitive Slave Act, slave catchers, people who were there to capture runaway slaves, could enter the north um, and capture these slaves and bring them back to their slave owners, and they would be paid quite handsomely um, for doing that. It also put um, the responsibility that if a runaway slave was detected, that the law enforcement of the North would have to step in and help facilitate their um, uh, detainment until the slave catchers could arise. As you can imagine, this did not go over well in the North. I mean, you had some cities, you look at a state like Vermont, Vermont had never had any slaves. It entered as a free state, um, but yet um, these people, you know, these infiltrators um, from the South, slave catchers could arrive and, um, uh, and detain these people who maybe had been living as a free person for, you know, for months, days, years, um, even if, you know, if they were a mile from the border to Canada. So that's why uh, the Underground Road had to go all the way to Canada is because that is um, that is where the, the freedom could be guaranteed. Uh, living in the North wasn't safe enough because of the Fugitive Slave Act. So Compromise of 1850. Uncle Tom's Cabin, we've already talked about and I provided in the notes for you there. So a book written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, it actually first appeared in 1851, but it wasn't published as an entire volume in 1852. Um, and something that I find sort of amazing is that it was the best-selling uh, book of fiction in the United States in all of the 1800s. So that sort of speaks to the popularity of it. It was actually, it also sold very well in England. Um, it was actually the second uh, best-selling book overall in all of the 1800s fiction or nonfiction. Does anyone want to take a guess what the best-selling book in America in all of the 1800s was? The Bible. The Bible was. Um, but behind that would be Uncle Tom's Cabin. So uh, it's an anti-slavery novel uh, written by this woman um, at um, on in Brunswick, Maine, uh, while her husband actually was a professor at Bowdoin College. Um, and it, uh, it inspired a lot of people to... Uh, think differently perhaps about the uh, slavery or to um, maybe uh, reinforce their, their beliefs about being anti-slavery. Uncle Tom's Cabin. The Kansas-Nebraska Act. Okay, so remember that Missouri Compromise that I mentioned a few minutes ago? Yeah, that's sort of out the window now, Missouri Compromise. Kansas-Nebraska Act, again, was seven years before the, um, the Civil War, this is now we get into like the bleeding Kansas stuff about John Brown that we talked about in the last unit. Um, it did away with the Missouri Compromise and the North South Division, but not in a way that abolitionists would have favored. Okay, it introduced something called popular sovereignty. So you can see here in the map, here's the Kansas Territory, bigger than Kansas is now, and here's the Nebraska Territory, bigger, way bigger than Nebraska is now. Um, but because these two territories were above north of the line uh, established in the Missouri Compromise, they shouldn't be able to have slavery. Well, um, that did not hold hold true. Um, the people of uh, what was introduced with the Kansas-Nebraska Act is popular sovereignty, which would allow people to uh, of those territories to vote on whether or not they wanted to go forward as a state or as a territory with slavery. So it's like, well, you get to choose. Well, who gets to choose, right? Like landowning white men are going to get to choose. Uh, people of color aren't gonna get to vote. Uh, slaves certainly aren't gonna get to vote. Women aren't gonna get a chance to vote. Um, the Native Americans who had lived in those lands aren't going to get it, or still live in those lands, aren't gonna get a chance to vote. Um, so this was seen as an extreme negative towards 
uh, for abolitionists because you could say, well, they might vote to not have slavery. Well, that's true, but you know, Nebraska territory goes all the way to Canada. So instead of slavery being something that was like, well, this is a Southern thing. This is going to stay in the South. You know, instead of slavery being something that exists, you know, here in the, in Virginia and Maryland and the Carolinas and Georgia, now slavery, at least in theory, certainly not in, in high numbers, is something that, that covers the majority of the continent now, uh, or at least the majority of the country. So very upsetting to people who um, thought that slavery was evil and should not be continued in America. Not only uh, is it continuing, but it's actually growing. Now we get to the Dred Scott decision. Okay, so this is the one that I'm uh, of the, the people I'm going to talk about, but it is one of the causes. It is a Supreme Court case um, that was actually batted around in the courts for almost ten years, really, uh, maybe even more than that. But I know there's a lot of cases. Part of the cases with the appeals courts and 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 uh, federal courts it, were back in 1852, 1853, things like that. So Dred Scott was enslaved. Um, he was a black man who was actually owned by a few different families and people. Uh, there were women who owned him because husbands had died, and then he was transferred to families and, and stuff like that. There was a, a former army uh, captain involved in this. It's really convoluted. Sometimes in, in your head, when you think of slavery, you think of like, you know, one person is owned from birth to death by a family on a plantation or something like that. Uh, but that just simply isn't so, especially as you get away from the South. So he lived in Missouri for most of his life, um, but was also taken to uh, states and territories uh, such as Illinois and Wisconsin, which are free states. Um, he actually ended up having uh, a wife and two daughters. He had um, a, a more of a, a family structure than most, than most slaves were allowed. Um, but after being uh, traded and deaths of owners and things like that. He, had, he actually ended up suing for his own um, freedom from Missouri. Now, he wasn't in a free state when he did the original suing, like uh, Illinois or Wisconsin. He was back in Missouri, which allowed slavery. But his case, as I said, it, you know, sometimes he'd win a decision, then it would be appealed. Sometimes he'd lose a decision, then it would be appealed. And it went all the way to the, to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court at the time was the chief justice was a guy named Roger Taney. So that's his picture right there. I think he was the fifth chief justice in American history. So he's the one who decides things, right? He, what, what cases the court hears. Um, and the court basically originally decided Scott couldn't sue because he was not a citizen. Now the Supreme Court actually does that quite often. Sometimes with cases that are, uh, I don't know, some, I, I'm not saying they, they do it to be lazy, but they do it to um, you know, if, if they don't feel someone has the standing to bring something to the court, then they just don't even bother hearing the case. They say like, well, we can't actually hear from this person, um, because they don't have the legal authority to bring the case to us. Um, sometimes there are difficult decisions that, that might be seen as an excuse for the Supreme Court not acting, but in any case, I'm not going to go into that now. They said that Scott couldn't sue because he was not a citizen as a, as a slave, um, he was not a citizen, but even in fact, as a black person, he was not a citizen. So it's almost like the Supreme Court is sticking their fingers in their ears because, and not addressing this case because of the skin color of Dred Scott and that he is not an American citizen. Now, that's a harsh reality, but it could have just stopped there. But this last part right here, the Supreme Court went even further and said that it was unconstitutional for any state to tell somebody what they could or could not own, right? Um, that that violated um, their rights as a citizen to not be able to uh, own personal property. So this actually made it so personal property rights were valued more than a state's anti-slavery laws. So if we actually go back to like a map like this, Right, so st I mentioned Vermont earlier, or even New Hampshire. Um, these are states that either have never had slavery or haven't had slavery for sometimes, you know, decades. Um, and all of these states now that haven't had slavery are being told, "Oh, actually, people can own slaves there because of this Dred Scott decision." So, as I said, the Dred Scott decision 
they could have just sort of ignored it because they say, Dred Scott, you're not a citizen. We're not going to hear your case. But they went even further by saying that any state's anti-slavery laws were against the Constitution, um, which, again, slavery now is seen, even if it's not in reality, it doesn't mean people in Portland, Maine are going to run out and, you know, buy people uh, and enslave them. But it's the idea that uh, instead of slavery being something that's dwindling, it is actually something that's growing. Uh, and Roger Taney went further. These are words from him in uh, written in the case. He said they, talking about blacks, had for more than a century been uh, before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Now, this is the person who is the head of the entire judicial branch of the federal government saying these terribly racist things. Um, and it took place 170 years ago, which you might say, like, well, that's a long time ago. It is, you know, if you look at the full span of how long humans have existed, it's really not that long ago that, uh, that this man was saying this uh, from his uh, seat on the Supreme Court. Uh, Raid on Harper's Ferry. So that's a should be a familiar uh, picture to you, John Brown. Um, from some of the abolitionist point of view, you know, maybe they viewed John Brown as going a step too far. But some thought, well, you know, this is this is uh, how he felt that slavery should end with a violent insurrection in the South and. Uh, you know, if you don't want to be killed as a slave owner, well, then don't be a slave owner. And that sort of solves your problem. Uh, I gave you a couple different images there of, of John Brown. Sorry, I'm trying to fight off the sneeze here. All right. Um, anyway, from the Southern perspective, though, we talk a lot about perspective. This was seen as an invasion, right? That a Northerner from Connecticut lived in Ohio, um, was out in Kansas, that he was going to cross into Virginia and attempt to take guns from the uh, military stockpile, the military arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Now, he failed uh, in spectacular fashion. He was tried. He was executed um, in 1859. But again, from the Southern point of view, Virginia, very powerful state, uh, had more people and slaves than any other state in the Union, uh, this was seen as a northern invasion, even if it wasn't organized, uh, even if it was, um, you know, not championed by many uh, abolitionists for its tactics, um, uh, this made many irate. So that just helped fuel the flames as we get closer and closer to the first battle. Lincoln's election. Uh, this was a big deal too, right? Uh, Abraham Lincoln, he won zero Southern states. In fact, he wasn't even on the ballot. He won fewer, he won less than 40% uh, of the popular vote in 1860. Uh, he was from uh, a, the free state of Illinois. His running mate, Hannibal Hamlin, was from Maine. So that was a free state. Um, even though Abraham Lincoln was not somebody who was, I'll use a dumb phrase, but he wasn't super anti-slavery. Um, he was against it, but like politically, he really wasn't willing to go out on the limb and say that uh, slavery should be banned. But even by being um, by being from the North, um, some of the things that he had said and going even going back to the uh, Mexican-American War, uh, people viewed this as um, they were concerned that he was going to do something uh, to help stop slavery. Um, and almost immediately, immediately after, right? So he was elected in on November 6th, 1860. Uh, by December 20th, I think, um, South Carolina had already decided to secede. Um, and South Carolina, again, South Carolina's coming up, they're joined by six other states. So before Abraham Lincoln can even take the oath of office, okay, oops, went too far. Before he can even take the oath of office, um, part of the country has decided we're not going to be part of the country anymore. We're not going to be part of the United States anymore. And they, and they form the Confederate States of America. Um, 
in their formation. It takes a little bit. Um, but that's sort of amazing, right? He doesn't have a chance to take the oath of office. Certainly, he hasn't passed any legislation. And Lincoln urges people, no, like th this is not my goal. I want to keep the country together at all costs. Um, I, he had no plans, at least that's what he said, of passing legislation to end slavery. Um, but some states decided um, that that was not enough. So before he can even take the oath of office, uh, people do leave. And that leads us to finally the first shots are fired. So this gives you a little idea of the map of what would become the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America, uh, and then the United States, which we'll call a lot of the time the Union. So the North and the South, and the first shots were fired. Now, Fort Sumter is down um, in Charleston Bay in South Carolina, um, and it's federal, right? It's it's run by the U.S. The, the, uh, the U.S. military. So it was sort of surrounded, you know, as it, as it stands uh, alone in the bay um, by people in South Carolina who uh, wanted the Union to leave because they didn't consider themselves to be part of that, that country anymore. Um, so one morning, I think it was like four in the morning, um, cannons uh, are fired upon the, uh, the fort. Now, in spite of the painting here, the good news is, is that um, only one person died, uh, and it was actually uh, nobody at the fort. It was uh, a Confederate, um, I think it was a Confederate soldier who like, fell off a horse, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, uh, which is sort of odd because it's an incredibly bloody war that starts in a very bloodless way. Um, but the Union troops left Fort Sumter, uh, surrendered the fort, um, and it's on. Now, there's, there isn't a battle immediately afterwards. It's sort of like both sides realize that this is going to become a, a true armed conflict, um, and they take time to uh, assemble their military, uh, train their soldiers, things like that. Uh, but the first shots fired April 12th, 18... Uh, oh, no. i got to change that right now. What am I doing? Oh, you know what? I had in my head a 12th, so it's actually 1861. Oh, my goodness. That's why I had the 12th in my head. It did not happen in 1812. It happened in 1861. Um, oh, uh, and last thing, I'm almost done here. Last thing I'll leave you with is you can see that the Confederate states, right, include Texas, and you see this pink line right here. So that line matters. But you'll also notice that some states allowed slavery, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, um, Maryland to Delaware, but, sorry, I sneeze coming on again. <coughs> sorry. Um, some states are above this line. They're north of this line, um, and they had slavery. Those are slave states that decided to stay with the Union, all right? And those were very important to Lincoln especially because they offered sort of a buffer. Um, so those are the, the, yes, they had slavery, but they chose to remain part of the union. So that's why the, um, the, the border, if you will, between the two countries is that, that pink purple line right there. Um, all right. I think that is it. Those are some of the uh, sources that I use for the images. So what you have to do is go back through, um, let's see, we've got Fort Sumter, on Brown, Compromise of 1850, Doctrine of Nullification, um, and that's it. Um, and provide some notes that, um, you know, bullet points, a few short sentences, whatever, uh, that cover some of the things that I mentioned. I know it was a long video. Uh, thanks for sticking uh, with it until the end. Um, but there were a lot of things that led to um, the bloodiest war in American history. So that's why we have to talk about them. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Looks sunny.